On behalf of CAI and the great IT professional, we'd like to welcome everyone today to this panel discussion on understanding the Internet of Things and its impact. My name is Michael Malutis, and I will be your moderator for today's event. I'd like to say a few words today about today's panelists. Dr. Larry Dribben is a consultant and educator who assists organizations under, in understanding and adopting new technologies and new government regulations. His consulting company, the Pearl Street Group, provides program and project management, process improvement and measurement consulting services to both business and information technology organizations. Dr. Dribben is also an adjunct professor at DePaul University, Chicago's College of Computers and Digital Media, where he teaches a variety of courses in cloud computing and software engineering. Don Shaper developed Athens Group's oil and gas practice, and he leads engineers in delivering software engineering services for exploration, production, and pipeline monitoring systems for international clients. An IEEE senior member, he is a software engineering subject matter expert for the Cockrell School of Engineering, the University of Texas at Austin. Athens Group is available internationally to assist organizations struggling with securing their information and operational technology networks from cyber criminals. They have mitigated Stuxnet and internet trolls. With over 10 patents, PMP, Certified Scrum Master, and SAFE certifications, Henry Will brings innovation, leadership, and soft skills to his successful teams. He has led initiatives in the IBM Watson Group, leveraging AI services for external clients, and he started a PMO for a London-based startup doing AI work with a top 10 U.S. telecom enterprise. Henry now leads artificial intelligence work on several chatbots for a global firm involved in human capital management and payroll. He's passionate about serving and helping people understand complex topics in a way that allows practical application while also serving as part of his Christian beliefs. So, if, could one of you give us an explanation or a basic definition of uh, what we're going to be talking about today when we talk about the Internet of Things? So, trying to simplify the whole thing, the Internet of Things is just connecting things together. So, um, you know, you could think of many examples of this when you think about your thermostats in your home. Uh, you know, now you've got the Nest thermostat and the Honeywell thermostat that connect to all that data that's coming from your, you know, HVAC system to, you know, some central place where it can be processed and analyzed. Uh, you know, you could have it on your watch, you know, a smartwatch. Uh, you can have Internet of Things on things, medical equipment, Internet of Things. Uh, your car can be connected. Uh, some new cars now today will do things like send information to a central location where it can be analyzed. Uh, the Internet of Things is just connecting things together through the use of the Internet. And, of course, there's many different protocols for that and different communication types. But when we talk about the Internet of Things, we're talking about connecting things together. Uh, of course, that means there's a lot of data and all that data can be analyzed and we can do things with that data. But simply put, it's connecting things together and allowing us to get at the data from them. I'll let one of the other, my astute panelists, <laughs> answer that in a better way. But simply put, that's how I would explain it. That Don, want to add anything? Go, go ahead, Larry. I'll I'll be the uh, cleanup hitter. You know, basically, the Internet of Things is connecting every possible device to the Internet so that they can be connected, whether or not they need to be connected, and many of them don't need to be. Uh, to me, it's uh, many, many things. So we say, what's the Internet of Things? It, there is no one thing. It's many different things. Uh, connecting your uh, home thermostat to the uh, internet uh, is one thing, but not nearly as uh, powerful, let's say, as uh, connecting uh, a surveillance system to the internet that needs to be analyzed to determine if uh, an intruder is into your system. So there's not one thing. And I also want to say it's not just things. Uh, we th think of it as hardware things. It's also software things. My phone's connected to the internet, but it's got, uh, you know, dozens of applications on it. Each one becomes its own thing. So I think, uh, Don, you said that, uh, what, as of this year, there are 43 billion devices on the Internet. I think you have to yeah, multiply that by uh, another number because a lot of those devices are uh, phones with have many, many uh, applications on them that are also connected to the Internet. Yeah, I, I agree with, you know, I, I agree with all those. I think the, you know, the, the idea that the Internet of Things that, all of you out there as, as participants in this are 
are experiencing. Um, Larry's right, when I did some research on it, by the end of this year, we're looking at about 46 billion connectable devices on the, on the internet. Now I said connectable, not connected directly right. to the internet because um, that's about six devices per person worldwide. And there's about going to be almost 8 billion people in the world by the end of the year. But one of the issues is we don't have enough internet addresses to connect all those. So there's ways that there are subnets and it becomes a very complex type of the system. Um, my, when I think of the internet of things, we do an enormous amount of work in the industrial internet of things. And, and I can talk about that at length later, but that's almost another, um, it's kind of another genre of the Internet of Things that, that I work with on a daily basis. So, um, Michael, did that, uh, did that help yeah, give no, you that a, was a wonderful, the answer as to what it is? Yeah, as usual, you guys have given me a wonderful uh, start to the discussion of the very, very nice uh, definitions. Uh, but help me understand something here, though. What, what, I mean, it's cute to kind of tie your thermostat to your watch to your coffee machine, and I'm sure that the people can get, you know, you know, have fun with, 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 with that sort of stuff. But what is the business? What is the ROI? What is the business case that would be driving this? I'll, I'll give you the, you know, when, in an industrial internet of things, we work in offshore oil and gas and, and we do the software engineering for these very large, enormous platforms. Each one of these platforms um, costs between one and one and a half billion dollars U.S. And on that, we may have um, we may have 300 separate sensors that really have their own address on the rig. You collect the data from those sensors, and that talks that tells us how each one of the subsystems is running. When you think about what that means, what it means is uh, in just one of our rigs, we drill. Um, it's in 10,000 feet of water, and when we hit the bottom, we then go down another 6,000 feet and make a right turn and go out 10,000 more feet. So I'm 26,000 feet away from my drill bit. And my Internet of Things is all the sensors on that drill string in the drill bit, all the pieces that are there. Without those sensors, I couldn't, I couldn't do the drilling. I couldn't get to oil and gas deposits that are offshore Africa, offshore Brazil. It just wouldn't happen. So the Internet of Things for me, the industrial Internet of Things, it means that I can actually perform the job I'm supposed to perform and I can do it safely and I've got an enormous amount of data. So in another realm, I can take that data and start doing predictive maintenance and I can do predictive analytics and I can start doing machine learning if you want to. But without the industrial Internet of Things, a lot of what we have today and what we produce from semiconductors to cars to yogurt wouldn't be possible. I think that that's the key. Basically, the Internet of Things is things connected to the Internet. What do things do? Well, we can monitor things. They can tell us the status of something, how fast something is spinning, how, how hot it is how cold it is, whatever, your, your blood pressure, uh, your heartbeat, whatever. And then there's actuators, devices that actually control things on the internet. And I think the real internet of things, the industrial internet of things is taking those sensors and collecting the data from them to determine how to control uh, an act actuator, whether it's turning uh, a thermostat up, opening a gas pipeline, saying stop uh, this uh, drill bit is starting to overheat uh, we need to lower the revolutions or add more uh, mudding fluid or whatever those are the kind of uh, internet of things that are are really key where you have a lot of data coming in and need to make decisions about that relatively quickly to control something hey henry i've got a uh, question for you and, and i know you've done a lot of work on kind of the personal approach to the Internet of Things and having to understand how it, I, I think that when I look at the people who who I hope are, are participating in this, that that I maybe one of the questions they have is what does this mean to me personally and how can I even get into it? Yeah, that's a good one, Don. And um, 
you know, when, when Michael asked about the business aspect of it, you know, um, I think both of you touched on the idea of mining data, right? Because these things that are connected to the internet generate or can generate a lot of data, you know, from the medical side. Like I think somebody here, you know, one of you mentioned about, you know, blood pressure readings or, you know, watching your heartbeat and this kind of thing. You know, medical data can be collected in the hospital or somebody working at home, you know, and their home can be measuring these things. Uh, my watch actually measures my heartbeat and tells me what my pulse is so that when I exercise, I know what, you know, what zone I'm in as far as my heart rate zone is concerned and what kind of exercise that I'm getting. So, you know, from a, you know, from a business aspect, uh, we can get a lot of information from all these sensors and that can be then mined and used in a way for, for businesses to, uh, as we said before, monitor things, determine how trends and figure out, you know, how to better service uh, the, the, the end customer. You know, how can we provide value to them? And, you know, why did I buy this smartwatch? Well, I bought this smartwatch because I can now, you know, look at my text messages. I can, uh, you know, read what my heartbeat is. I can see how much I exercise. That has a GPS built in. So there's another sensor so I could tell, you know, how far I went on a journey and uh, how many, how much of a al altitude I climbed, this type of thing. So all this data is something that adds to the experience that I have as a consumer. And that is something that's sellable, you know. So you mentioned about the oil drills. You know, that's a way that, you know, business can benefit from it in the industrial sense. And we know that medicine can benefit from the Internet of Things because they can measure things and doctors can get data that they weren't able to get a hold of before. Or they could only get data when somebody came in for an office visit or came was in the hospital. Now they can get data from all different areas where people are at home or whatever. So on the hobbyist side, asking that question, if you want to say the hobbyist side, uh, one of the ways that we can get involved in the Internet of Things is actually uh, working with it with hands on if we want to. And you know, I'm going to be speaking October the 13th uh, for the great IT Pro. Uh, I have a webinar where I'm going to be talking more about the Internet of Things and getting into some of the details of the type of things that if we want to do hands on and actually play with the Internet of Things and learn more about the details of how to actually implement Internet of Things. That'll be something I'll be talking about more. But you know, it is possible out there. There's many hobbyist groups. Uh, you can go on to some of the hobbyist pages and uh, like meetups and that kind of thing to find things about IoT. There's several places where you can go to labs and actually get your hands on equipment and, and play with it, work with it. Uh, many high schools now and colleges are working with the Internet of Things so that people can get hands on. But if you want to do it at home, there's organizations out there, there's companies out there that that sell the hardware. Uh, you can get, uh, you know, all types of sensors. Uh, I know that a lot of people like to do things like, uh, you know, let's measure the humidity in my house plants and it'll remind me when it's time to give them more water, that type of thing. You know, that's like a common experience, experiment that somebody has. Uh, another one that people like to do is like controlling lights. Uh, when I worked at IBM, uh, one of our, uh, one of our, big engineers that's really well known, uh, uh, he had put together some glasses that, uh, you know, would animate with lights around them uh, according to like what you could hook it up to things like the, you could hook it up to like tweets and find out if somebody's tweeting about you, then your lights go off on your glasses, this kind of thing. I know somebody else set one up where whenever the, inter the International Space Station was going to pass over their house, he had a light that would blink in his house uh, and he did that by using API calls, which I can get to in that webinar that I'm going to do. But the idea is that there's a general, uh, I guess you could say, well, API stands for Application Programming Interface. So there's a way that you could make a call on the Internet and get data about where the International Space Station is located. And he was able to set that up so that when it was coming close to pass over his house, he could flick, flicker this light bulb and he knew he could go outside with a pair of binoculars and look for it in the sky. So, I mean, there's all kinds of different projects that you could do as an experimenter, as a hobbyist that helps you to understand more about it. But one of the things too that I hope to do when I get into that webinar is to show people, just give them a, 
an understanding of the Internet of Things. Some of the things that we've talked about here is like the architecture of the Internet of Things, right? So you have something that, if you want to say, is the input, which is a sensor, and then you have a communication channel of some kind or another, which usually we use the Internet, but not always. Sometimes we might use something like Bluetooth, and there are several other ways to communicate with these sensors or these inputs. And then you have some kind of a collection device or a processor, right? So you might have a little microcontroller or something like a, some people use an Arduino or some people will use like a Raspberry Pi or something to connect to uh, do the processing to collect all this data. And then you have some kind of an output. You know, you can store that out in a, on the Internet, on a cloud drive, you know, some kind of cloud database, or you could store it locally, you know, depending on what the data is that you have. And then you might have an output. You might have a display that displays information. Uh, building a weather station is a good example, you know. Can we sense information like wind speed and then display it on a display? That kind of thing. So there's lots of different ways that you can experiment with it. And just learning about how experimenters use it, I think, is a good learning experience, too. So I hope some of you might think about coming to that webinar coming up October 13th. I think we want to make a distinction, though. To me, that a simple reading a humidity in a plant and then deciding when to water it is not necessarily the Internet of Things. It's a closed-loop oh, feedback control system. But the real right. Internet of Things, I think, that Don and I are talking about are where you're putting massive amounts of data that need to be analyzed. And that's not really the hobby world. The maker world right. is all over. I mean, I've got a number of yeah. Arduino projects that I'm, right. I'm doing in one of my hobbies. But that's, to me, far different than the kind of Internet of Things that we're, we're talking about there. And I think that's one of the problems. The Internet of Things is not one thing. We need to di differentiate. And I don't think we explain it very well. A small uh, closed loop feed rack system, let's say your house thermostat, is one thing. Uh, and that doesn't need the internet at all. It happens to do the internet to send data, in my case, to Honeywell or to Nest to do something, but it's very it's not very useful. And I think that's one of the things that there's an awful lot of hype on what the internet of things could do. The same mm -hmm. thing with your watch and reading your heartbeat, you know, Apple's come up with their watch where they can analyze the data and look for atrial fibrillation, which is a big thing because that can cause or be the precursor to strokes. It doesn't need the Internet of Things to do that. Now, they do use it to gather data to improve their algorithms, but I think that's where we need to differentiate better between a simple control system and true Internet of Things where we're getting massive amounts of data that need analysis, pattern matching by major AIs to come up with a recommendation of what to do next. And I think then we talk about the Internet of Things, and I've been reading a lot of articles and watching a number of YouTube videos on that. There's not a differentiation of that. Turning lights on in my house is not a big deal. I don't need the Internet of Things to do that. They'd be telling me that the weather that uh, is going to be potentially a uh, a thunderstorm, but I, I get that another way. I don't need to do that with the Internet of Things. So as Good as, point, Larry. as IT as IT professionals, and we we're all we're all you know I, IT information technology and and OT operational technology professionals. I I look at I look at some of the I look at the hobbyist um, Internet of Things, and and uh, from the point of view of you know, I'll, I'll go back into the dark ages of time and in the uh, mid 1970s when I was in graduate school and and luckily my when I grew up, I was seven year old, seven years old when I got my first soldering iron from my father, who was an engineer and we built lots of that, lots that explains of explains a lot that Heath kit, Icos, all these different electronic kits. And what that eventually led me to do was when I was in graduate school, I decided I was tired of going to the computer center at midnight and I bought a personal computer, a kit and put it together and built my own MITS Altair. And that to me was one of the, the things that, you know, I'm mostly a software engineer, but I am an engineer. And because of that experience, I, I know enough about hardware to make myself dangerous. The, I think the, the hobbyist aspect is important for all of us as IT professionals because we learn something that's a little bit different, but it helps us tie together how it would work within our own organizations. Is that is that something that you know you both feel is you know a benefit to to doing some 
what we would think of as hobbyist work for the IoT? Oh, I think it's absolutely uh, key that we teach everybody these skills because that's going to be the skills for the future. You know, I mean, our library has a big program here where I live in uh, maker uh, movement and different classes on Arduinos to uh, 3D printers. I think, you know, there's a lot of movement to teach everybody at every level from literally uh, kindergarten on how to program. I think that's key because that's a uh, part of it. Uh, but there's also an awful lot of hype, and I think that's one of the areas that is a concern. You know, we're not going to suddenly get massive improvements in healthcare without uh, remotely without much better sensors that haven't been developed yet. Uh, the, the, what we have today is fairly trivial. Will it get better? Absolutely. Uh, will we want that? Will we want a brain implant to read our hormone levels or something like that? I don't know. That could probably be some of the things we're going to have to look at in the future. But, the, you know, the hype that we're going to get a massive smart cities or a smart house, um, you know, plus we've got to temper that with security issues. And one of the things that I'll give an example of is security. I, I bought a new house a while ago. I have my lights are controlled by uh, my phone. My furnace is controlled by my phone as well as the thermostat. And I was going to add on a remote control uh, garage door opener. Uh, my garage door supported that, so I went to buy the piece of equipment, the internet connection from Home Depot. And I would, same time I'm doing it, I'm reading a lot of journals. And I read a journal uh, article on the, the company uh, Chamberlain that makes those and how terrible security was on their or internet-based garage door openers, and this individual talking about it says, I'm actually working with them to improve security. I immediately got back in my car, went back to Home Depot, and returned it. Because the last thing I want is somebody able to drive by and open up my garage door while I'm not home and potentially, you know, clearing my house out. And I think the same thing with uh, uh, electronic locks. You have to be very careful. There's huge security issues, and most of the people playing with it, especially the the uh, hobbyists, but even more so major companies like Chamberlain, which owns the, the garage door market, don't know how to write secure software. I think the same thing is happening with 5G. I was just reading an article with Huey, one of the major suppliers of 5G devices. They said there's over 300 in this one block of code areas where they're not using good uh, uh, safe uh, uh, programming practices on uh, C, uh, and that they're opening up a potential opening either intentionally or unintentionally to allow security issues. So a major issue we have to deal with is security anytime we talk about the Internet of Things. Uh, I'd like to know about, uh, you know, maybe if, if you haven't covered it yet, and I did miss, I missed, by the way, the whole, um, the whole past 15 minutes. So uh, have we talked about, for instance, what businesses need to be thinking about um, in order to get involved in this, what, should, what kind of questions should they be asking themselves? What are some best practices? What should they not be doing? Where are the sort of risks and pitfalls? I know that you've kind of touched on some of that, but have we addressed that in full yet? Not, not yet, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll start on that because I keep getting on my, uh, my, my soapbox of, uh, of process. But I think there's, you know, there's, there's four main um, Areas that you have to look at uh, when you look at IoT. The first is is data, and and Larry said it, Henry said it. You know the reason why we we have IoT is is to collect the data. I mean this is the best biggest data generator in history. So you have to understand first what data you want to collect. The second is what devices are you going to use? What kind of sensors? How are you going to do the data collection? Where are they going to fit? Then. How are you going to process the data? Because that determines where does the data go to? You send it all to the cloud and process it in the cloud, or some of it you got to process on the device, which then means how much memory do you need? All these other things that that we as architects and hardware software people have looked at for over the years. And and finally, it's the connectivity. How do you connect it all together? Do you have one little web, uh, one little set within your house, or do you expand it? So. Those are the, the four things that I look for, but I'm, I'm sure there's more. 
you definitely covered the one very important area is, uh, you know, trying to find business value in it. And then also the other thing, too, is, you know, making sure that you have a good architect. Uh, because like you spoke before, you've got the security aspects that have to be considered. And the architect also has to take into consideration, you know, the whole total system of where the processing is going to happen and how much data is going to be sent and how it's going to be analyzed. But I think from a business perspective, businesses need to think about, again, one of the things I mentioned before is what's the value to whoever the customer or the consumer is going to be, whether it be in an industrial application, medical, or whatever industry it is, or whether it's in the consumer industry. Uh, you've got to think about, you know, what is the value going to be to them? What's the value add that's going to make it uh, to the point where they're going to say there's a good return on investment there and it's worth them spending the extra money? So, uh, you know, the analysis of, of all that data is something that's very important to the Internet of Things. And I think one thing, too, Michael, that you might want to touch on at some point, I forget if you had it in your list of questions that we were going to discuss, but what does it mean for a project manager? Because we might have a lot of project managers on the line. And what does it mean for a project manager to be involved in the IoT and what do they need to know? Well, I think right off, I think they need to do some investigation and research and some reading into understanding how the architecture works and how these devices are connected together so that they understand how networking works. So networking is a big part of it. I think another big part of it is also data collection. You have to do some data cleansing. You have to you know, work with somebody that's maybe a data scientist, depending on what the application is. So you have to understand that field to a certain extent too, because uh, we're talking about big data here. And then I think that that project manager would also have to have a good understanding of what the ROI is. You know, what's the business case for this project that they're working on and what's going to bring the most value to that project? Because that, that return on investment is something that's very important in any project that we work on. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of things that go wrong. Uh, for instance, not understanding networking, not understanding architecture, not understanding data science, hardware issues, security issues, and that there's just a lot of expertise, highly specialized expertise that needs to be brought to bear in these types of projects. But the key point that you made you know, about business value really gets to the heart of it, which is that, you know, what is it that you want us to do and why? And that then from that would flow, I guess, the type of metrics and the type of data that you want. Uh, Don, can you give us an example? You were, before we got, I got cut off, uh, you were mentioned that you had some experience with the industrial internet of things. That seems to be an area where IoT has kind of matured more uh, than the, from the, the normal marketing stuff that we hear. How, oh, give us an, can you give us an example of how business value is identified and created with internet of things in the industrial world? So there, there have been a number of uh, number of areas, Michael. I think the in the industrial world, we're we're lucky that from the point of view of uh, the Internet of Things, we've got a large base upon which we're building, and that base is what is known as the SCADA systems, S C A D A, which is supervisory control and data analytics. This comes from the 1950s, you know, from you know, when there were vacuum tubes and mechanical switches and and this was where you had analog gauges and eventually those became uh, connected so that you had large buildings with lots of people sitting there monitoring what was going on. This led this led directly to when you look at uh, not only just the offshore area we work in, but we also do some work on pipelines, especially cybersecurity. We're very familiar with what happened to the Colonial Pipeline. And the Colonial Pipeline was not a failure of the Internet of Things. It was not a failure of the SCADA. It was a failure of their admin systems. You know, it was the admin systems that got hacked. And that's what caused them to shut it down because they were concerned that it would leak into the control systems. But today, you can't you can't do moving oil around, moving gasoline around, uh, when you move things around through pipes, which in many cases could be molasses. It could be some type of slurry that you're using. And in between one every one of those is what's known as a pig, which is a plug that goes between the different things you're sending down the pipeline. The pigs are smart. They've got, they're part of the internet of things that are part of the, part of the uh, pipelines and they tell you what the temperatures are, how fast it's moving, where it is, hooking into GPS satellites. Without the Internet of Things, we couldn't do 
what we do today in pipelines. It, it just, it wouldn't exist because we need that data collection and we need it to be feeding into the already existing SCADA systems. We've updated the SCADA systems as we've updated the Internet of Things or the, the sensors and the different small processors, basically PLCs, the programmable logic controllers that are in the system. So for me in the industrial Internet of Things, the Internet of Things has become a framework that I can talk to with our clients. It's a way for me to put together, show them their architecture, show them where their vulnerabilities are, and then explain to them because they understand what the Internet of Things is. It's actually made it easier to speak to them about that and show them where their vulnerabilities are. Larry, do you have any thoughts about uh, about this question of if you're, uh, how do you, how, what sort of business value and what sort of questions do you want to ask in order to identify uh, the type of metrics that you should be collecting um, as, a, as a starting point? Well, I, I think Henry really said it that you need to understand what's the problem you're trying to solve and many, uh, and, and then what's the ROI. And in many cases, we're not very good at doing that. But there's another issue here that I think is important that it's hard to sometimes understand the, the problem we're trying to solve or, or the solution. I'll give you an example of, let's say, uh, the smart metering system for uh, electricity or power. Typically in the past, the, uh, the electric supply company monitored your meter maybe once, once a month, uh, sometimes not even that often, someone maybe came by because it was just not designed to be hooked up to the internet. And then we started hooking it up to the internet and we went from once a month measurement to maybe a measurement every uh, 10 minutes. Well, think of the volume of increase of data and what do we do with that? And what they really wanted to do with that is say, well, we want to control when we bring various uh, uh, electric sources online. They don't all have the same cost, a, a old uh, gas generator, a uh, coal fire generator may be much more expensive, let's say, than a, uh, a new solar system, but I may need it for peak demand. But we don't know exactly what questions to ask because we have so much data, we haven't had a chance to understand the analysis. And we don't have the uh, control system in place to do much with that. You know, what we get now, people coming up with their own solar. Well, the basic electrical grid isn't designed for homes, to, it's basically designed one way, supply to your house, not from your house back to the supply. So there's all kinds of issues that we need to figure out. And that's why there probably needs to be a lot of exploration, exploratory analysis to try and figure out what we need, how we d determine that. And that's gonna require a lot of data, a lot of analysis, but it's not necessarily gonna yield immediate uh, ROI right away. And I think we have to be prepared for that. How many do we we really have a smart grid? Do we really how much batteries do we need? What kind of batteries? Uh, uh, how often do we need to do that? Uh, that whole an economic analysis of what to bring on what and how you're using your power. Can we really give you lower power because you're in the peak demand? Most houses aren't designed to do that. Some businesses are. So there's a lot of issues and questions along the way before we really get to the real value of this. And I think that's one thing where the hype is taking over, or we're gonna connect everything to the internet, we're immediately gonna get value. It could be 10 or 20 years before we get value from this, because it's gonna take that long to replace the uh, the grid system with a better grid. And just the case of smart electricity, just in that one area. When you, you, you keep mentioning, you keep refer, uh, emphasizing how much data we're talking about here, I mean, does this sort of open up an opportunity for machine learning in terms of in terms of uh, resolving the facing the challenge of this analysis or are there more simple uh, techniques that can be used, uh, you know, mathematical processing regression analysis without having turn turning to machine learning? Or does this, in fact, open up a huge opportunity for machine learning for fine deep learning, perhaps for finding value and uh, uh, from massive amounts of data where we don't even quite know where we don't know where the value is. I'm going to give you a quick answer, and then I'll let either um, uh, Henry or, or Donald. The answer is yes and yes. It does allow for uh, major um, machine learning, and I don't even say machine learning, artificial intelligence, because 
you're, when you're analyzing a lot of data, you're not necessarily doing machine learning to try and find patterns that make sense. Uh, but sometimes very simple algorithms work just as well, if not better. And I think that's where the data scientists are needed to help figure that out. Uh, once we figure that out, you know, for example, with the Johnson and uh, not the Johnson Jackson with the uh, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, we had seven cases of blood clots causing issues out of 70 million shots of uh, people that were inoculated. Do you know how small that is? Uh, the wrong people could have said, that's an outlier, let's throw it out, versus analyzing it, which I think we're very good that the FDA has in place the mechanisms to don't throw things like that out to say, you know, it's an, not an outlier, it's a potential problem, and we need to be careful when we give these vaccines uh, to various people. Henry, you've got some uh, you've got some experience in in this area. What do you think? Yeah, well, uh, definitely. Depending on again, it gets back to the application, right? And what is the ROI on it? But uh, you know, any time that we talk about big data, uh, we're definitely thinking that uh, sure. You know, Michael asked if you know this is something that simply can be measured. Sure, I mean. Uh, could we take data and put it into a spreadsheet and analyze it manually? Yeah, we can do that. But when we're talking about big data, we're talking about massive amounts of data, then it gets to the point where you have to automate it. And what's the best way to automate uh, massive amounts of data is to use some analysis, right? A uh, tool for analysis. And of course we look, you know, now these days we're gonna be looking towards some kind of machine learning or deep learning to do that, that's right. Uh, basically, when I like to explain machine learning, machine learning is all about trying to find some way to mathematically represent uh, trends in data or uh, the way that data points relate to one another, right? Um, you know, we talk about, you know, linear regression and other types of regression. Uh, those are machine learning algorithms that are, they're just examples of machine learning algorithms. And the idea there, with machine learning is to come up with some way to represent data in a more simpler uh, method, right? So for instance, uh, you know, we might get tons and tons of data from, uh, you know, I worked on a project years ago where we were collecting data from an aircraft engine because they were having problems with these engines where they would just all of a sudden just uh, disintegrate or blow up. And they wanted to find out, you know, what caused this to happen? And is there any precursor, or any information that there would be available uh, in advance so that they knew when these engines needed to be serviced or something so that they could catch them before they ran into some kind of a catastrophic event. So they were collecting massive amounts of data. Well, back then, you know, the amount of machine learning that was available, you know, there, there was a lot of it. Uh, it wasn't as easy to do as it is today, and they didn't have the Internet of Things back then when I worked on that project. So what we had to do is we needed to collect it in a big a bunch of memory, and then we need to take that memory and hook it up with a cable into another box that would do the analysis. But today, uh, you can envision that an aircraft could have sensors that are real-time measuring data and sending that someplace over, say, you know, the internet using cell con cell connections or you know, cellular connections or whatever, or ground to, I mean, air to ground uh, information through, um, you know, something like, um, what do you call it, microwaves? that type of thing, or satellite connections that could use satellite. But that data could then be connected over the in, collected over the internet and analyzed real time and could, uh, you know, uh, do some proactive analysis and, and allow us to know that there's a situation where maybe an aircraft should be grounded and uh, maintenance be performed uh, because we can be analyzing that data real time. So that's where the internet of things comes in to be a way that reduces risk by giving us proactive ways to measure data and do analysis real time and not have to wait until something happens to go back and look at it. You know, think about, um, you know, a traffic light at an intersection, uh, you know, maybe years ago, uh, you know, somebody could look and say, you know, there's a trend that at this intersection, there's a lot of accidents, but nowadays uh, we can put up a camera and we can watch things and we can analyze video using deep learning and find out maybe why there's an, an issue in that intersection of why there's accidents and be proactive about maybe setting the way that the traffic lights work or something proactively, maybe during certain times of the day, maybe it, uh, through analysis, it can determine that, 
you know, maybe it's during rush hour or something, or it's on a lunch hour. Maybe there's a restaurant nearby or something that a lot of people sit in line and wait for that restaurant to open, or to, maybe it's got a lot of people to service because of the large demand. So we can do, you know, with the Internet of Things, we can do real-time analysis of data because it can be sent to a central location for that analysis. I think, Don, it was either you or Larry that had mentioned about, you know, doing doing some of the processing at the endpoint. You know, we talk about processing at the edge, right? So those sensors can have uh, some type of analysis being performed there with a small processor unit. And then after it processes the data, send it over the Internet to some major, um, you know, cloud-based uh, analysis, and that can be done there. But I think that one of the things that we have to think about with the Internet of Things is that the ability for us to now have real-time access to data, and one of the applications in this idea of what I was talking about with this uh, aircraft engines is it can allow us to do proactive measurement and to avoid any type of a bad experience, excuse me, a bad experience by doing that analysis real-time in advance and proactively so that we can make decisions ahead of time. Now, businesses can use data the same way to make business decisions because they now through the Internet of Things can have, you know, access real time to data and make decisions uh, on the fly for things that businesses need to make decisions on. Like, for instance, uh, going back to the aircraft, you know, what the locations of our their aircraft, if there was some kind of a weather situation, you know, how might they proactively place where the the um, you know where the airplanes are ahead of time, so that they can work around a storm or something. So these type of things are something that the Internet of Things opens up to us. I think is is just to build on that, Henry. The whole idea of you know monitoring your supply chain. A lot of companies are doing just in time inventory management. Right. And to know that you have to understand your supply chain and take action if a, a part of the supply chain isn't operating at an optimal level. Uh, what's your backup plan to continue uh, to provide uh, supply to your particular uh, facility or plant? So let yeah, me give you with, a... Today with COVID, we've got a lot of yeah. supply chain issues that uh, people, I think, a lot of companies are wishing that they would have built something into their into their processes to uh, take care of the situation that we're seeing today where maybe the transportation is not available as much as it was widely available just about a year or two ago. Let me let me go to uh, another another use of the Internet of Things that many of us uh, may may find useful because we probably all shop for groceries and and being in Austin, Texas, and having been in Austin now since um, 1988, this time uh, we've done a lot of work and seen a lot of a lot of things happen of companies that have come out of Austin. One of those is Whole Foods, and I'm sure most people are aware of Whole Foods. Those of us who who started my company now, Athens Group, in '98, we had worked with another company. Uh, group most of us had we either worked in semiconductors or we worked for this one other IT company. And and these guys uh, started out with two customers. One was John Mackey, who at that time was getting ready to buy his second store for Whole Foods. The other one was Michael Dell, who who the founder of the other company wrote his first accounting package for. So we're familiar with with these two large large retail, you know the you know the retail organization of Whole Foods. Uh, Dell Computing, which is the world's most successful screwdriver shop. You know, this is, these are two real interesting companies. We did work for Whole Foods um, back in the early aughts, well, middle, probably 07, 08, 09. Um, one of our consulting groups worked with them because they were looking at pricing models. And, and something that's incredibly data intensive is the pricing models in Grocery stores. Grocery stores work on a one and a half to three percent margin, incredibly small margins. Any pricing differential matters. And what we put together for them was that they were already collecting data. Every tag had an RFI, RFID on it, um, so it knew what it was. They it also knew the count that was in the inventory, and you could see from the point of sale system. Who was buying what? 
and what was popular and what wasn't. And in real time, we would adjust the pricing models based on all the data on a per store basis. And, and we, we wrote a patent on that pricing model because it took at the store level, it collected the data and ran it through a model. And we were basically using Kwebyshev polynomials, eight to ninth derivative polynomials that figured out what the next price point should be to sell more. And it was done instantaneously in real time, but we couldn't have done it without the RFI chips, without the readers, without the point of sale systems. All of those, when I think of the internet of things, I think in retail, that's an example of the internet of things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as, as uh, Henry says, you know, this idea of moving to the edge, one of the issues you know, with, the, with reading monitors and controlling actuators or control systems is latency. And uh, when we have a wired internet, that's pretty consistent. But a wireless internet, the current uh, 4G technology is not very good. It's uh, 30 to 70 millisecond latency. And so as we get new devices that we need to respond more quickly, we need to figure out how to get to reduce that uh, online latency, the wireless latency. And that's one area where I think uh, 5G will go along with uh, the Internet of Things to help reduce that latency to the point where we can add more devices that require more fine tuning control. I wanted to, so I saw one question in there in the question uh, that I thought was interesting, and I'm not sure I know the answer, but is there any organization that rates devices on uh, security of Internet capable devices? And I, I don't know of any, I don't know if UL is doing that or not, it certainly could. I think that's probably something that we need to put in place either by law or by agreement that devices need to be uh, not only are they electronically safe, but are they se secure safe and you all might be a good thing so that in the future you don't buy a device to put on the Internet or maybe can't even sell it without it being uh, you all approved for security. Uh, but I haven't I don't know of any other organization doing that you Don or Henry. I don't. Henry, do you? Companies out there that, like, uh, for instance, if you're trying to come up with a device, there's companies out there that will do security audits for you on an IoT device. But um, I think what the question seems to be is more along the lines of how can we as a consumer know that the IoT device that we're buying is secure enough? And I think the only way to do that is to go back to that, you know, maybe before you make a purchase, I, you know, going back to the garage door story, garage door opener, I think go back to that company and ask them, you know, what did they put in place to check the security? And, and did they use a external third party organization to do a security audit to find out whether there, it actually is secure? So that's that's one thing that we can do as consumers. But if you're in a business, um, you know, if this is a business situation where, you know, say you're a project manager of a IoT project, uh, one of the things that you're going to want to build into your schedule is to have some kind of a security audit done. And maybe depending on the application of that project and that, that end product that you're coming up with or service that you're coming up with is that you may want to then publicize what your security process was to make sure that it was secure and whatever audits you had done on that device or on that service that you're going to launch. I think that's a great idea, Henry, that for project managers, there's a lot more than just slapping a few uh, sensors together and controllers to put together a viable uh, IoT solution, security being a key part of that. Yeah, I think security is, is really important in the IoT world. Let me give you another example. We do, we're one of the few companies that uh, still works in Russia and we've got a we've got an office uh, on Sakhalin Island and the reason why we still can is there's no restrictions against um, working in the oil and gas arena in in Russia providing it's not in shale it's not in the Arctic and it's not in deep water so we work in all of those we work for Exxon in in uh, five sites that are there five fairly large drilling rigs. And, and we put together the whole cybersecurity program for those five sites. And, and there were, when I went back and looked at the alarm list, I just looked at it 
a um, couple of days ago in prep for this, we had, we realized there were 1,200 basically the IoT data sources on those five rigs. And, and we evaluated packages to look at it. One of the packages we evaluated, and, and this, is a, um, this is a cautionary tale for all of us, was solar winds. And, and we realized that solar winds was not adequate, wasn't adequate for what we needed. It couldn't handle the Internet of Things issues. It couldn't handle, we would flood it and, and it wouldn't be any good. Thank goodness we didn't go with that. Um, and so as part of that, we basically isolated each subnet within each asset. So depending on the asset for a land rig, there were probably 12 subnets and then five uh, other ones that would be in there on a temporary basis. And we tested every one of those. We used intrusion. We went back and checked uh, source code. We looked through all the areas and, and we went through this. And, and luckily, knock on wood, we haven't had that problem. And as we sit there in Russia, when we look at the cybersecurity issues, we see it from both sides of the wall. You know, we see people, non-government actors from all over the world trying to hack it, including the U.S. And, and you can see that and you can track it, but we couldn't have done that if we didn't have a detailed architecture of every device that was there and we had strong management of change so that nothing was changed without our knowledge and retesting. And so again, it goes back down to the, you know, the, you know, the, the blocking and tackling, you've got to do the basics of engineering. You've got to do the very basics of cybersecurity. The internet of things is it's, I jokingly say it's really, it's old wine in a new bottle. It's the same data we've been collecting. It's the same things, except we've, We've upgraded the attack sphere because we're now on the internet. So we've got to be doubly careful on what we put together and how we do it. You know, when I read about internet of things, I'm always hearing people talking about smart cities. Um, I'm not even sure what that means. Uh, does anybody have an idea about what they mean when they talk about smart cities? Uh, what would what would municipalities or cities be using this for? To uh, and 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 why? What would be the opportunities for them? You can't have smart cities well, until you have smart politicians, Michael. <laughs> I, I think that's one of the areas where you talk about hype. You know, people talk about smart cities and how great it's going to be, without defining it. I have an article I was just reading that's talking about. Uh, 5G expectations versus reality. And then they talk about these. They're going to carry very specific examples of what it can do. And in there, they mention smart cities, and that's it. That's not a very specific example. Does it help you control your lights, control your water, uh, traffic? There's so many different things. And many cities are doing a lot of that already. You know, I, that, that's where I, I think we need to better define the problem at hand and stop some of the hype and say what are you really what do you mean by a smart city what are you going to do are you going to be uh better traffic management better management for emergencies uh I, I don't know what the answer is the same thing for the smart home uh, I don't know when people talk about that usually it's like in wake up and my lights will automatically turn on and turn the hue that i want you know to me that uh talking about roi is for me not a lot of roi some people it may be, but it's not worth a lot of effort on my part. Yeah, I know that when I worked at IBM, we talked about smart cities and most of the projects that we were talking about were things like items that you already mentioned there, Larry, things like, you know, traffic control, you know, how can we control traffic? How can we reduce the amount of air pollution caused by traffic, you know, by doing monitoring or can we, um, some, some cities now are doing things like they're charging people a, uh, different rates for, uh, you know, coming into a city, depending on the time of day that they come in. So they want to reduce the amount of traffic. So they might charge more to like cross a bridge or something or go through a toll. Uh, if they do it during rush hour, than if they do it during some other part of the day, and they can also monitor, you know, how long have you been in the city? You know, how long are you keeping your car in the city or whatever your vehicle or whatever. Another thing that they talked about was, uh, you know, monitoring things like, uh, water. Because uh, apparently there's a lot of um, water 
companies that are finding that there's a lot of water left uh, lost through leakage. They can monitor pipelines to find out where the leakages are and try to you know correct those. I'm trying to think of some of the other ways that they were talking about, but they are two that I remember off the top of my head projects that they had worked on. I know that there was also an application that they had talked about with IoT where they were monitoring um, you know animals uh, in Africa, if I recall. There was a certain species, and I can't remember what it was exactly, but there was an endangered species where you know they tagged them and they could watch where they were going and and from that information, they could try to track down to find out where the poachers were that were attacking these animals because these were animals were mostly um, you know the victims of poachers, and they wanted to track the location of the animals and then they could find out you know, where the poachers were and where they were being attacked by by where the location of the animals were and what they were finding out about them, whether they were still moving and that kind of thing. So, I mean, as far as smarter cities are concerned, yeah, I think there might be applications there, but I think Don hit on the point, you know, that, uh, you know, whenever we market IoT things, we're always looking for a market, right? So cities might be one market, could touch those politicians and see if they can't bring value to a city. And I think the same thing is true of uh, consumers. You know, everybody's always trying to come up with some new idea that might wow us and make us think that it's going to be worth a lot. But I think, Larry, as you said, you know, whether I'm going to have an IoT device that I turn it on or start my coffee in the morning isn't a big deal. I can put a timer on my coffee maker and I can walk down the stairs and push the button for the light. So <laughs> some of these things maybe aren't exactly. as much. Uh, as much uh, value as they are hype. And it's just, you know, being able to tell somebody, hey, I've got this really cool thing that does such and such. But then when we find out after we've had it for a while that maybe the value of it to us isn't <laughs> all as much as we thought it was going to be. Well, two two aspects of that. One is so these uh, cameras to, uh, you know, uh, uh, watch, watch for people running red lights, you know, red light cameras. Uh, that was a big thing in Seoul to prove safety in reality. Any every analysis I've seen is they're only doing it to get more money for the cities, and they actually cause they don't reduce any major accidents, and they cause a lot more minor accidents. As somebody realizes a red light camera and they hit the brakes, and someone hits them in the, as a small five mile an hour rear end. So we got to be very careful when we go to uh, ROI. Another thing here in Chicago, we have something called Shot Spotter, where they have microphones all over areas where there's high crime to listen for gunshots. And from that, they can triangulate to see where it is and get the police there literally almost as it's happening. And uh, one of the universities just did an analysis of the data and said of, I don't know, 12,000 or something like that incidents, there hasn't been one that had uh, uh, in, involved in a major arrest or a crime reduction. On the other hand, the Chicago police says it's a great thing. We love it. So what's the real IRI there? I think we have to be very careful. I think, Henry, your idea is about what's the problem we're trying to solve and the solution and how do we measure ROI is real key. And in many cases, we're not there yet. This is going to take years to figure out uh, and and honest politicians to uh, to say the right thing. Because, to you know, I understand it's a revenue source of, with these red light cameras uh, for many small cities, but Let's be honest of what it's really doing. It's not doing what we intended uh, to reduce accidents. I apologize if this question was was covered uh, during my absence, but um, I also read a lot about uh, how uh, Internet of Things requires low latency, high speed, high bandwidth. Uh, does that in turn necessitate a full 5G rollout before uh, IoT can become a, a, a fully commercialized you know, reality? Or are there other possible um, solutions out there that will provide low latency besides like 5G. Does that, do you have any thoughts about that? Was 5G discussed well, at all? I'm going to answer real quickly, Michael, and yes, I just, it depends on the problem. If you're a wireless device that needs to respond to uh, sensors in microseconds or short uh, milliseconds, then you need 5G. How many devices need that? If I'm dealing with something atrial fibrillation, it's not in the microseconds, it's in, in minutes. And, you know, you get an alert and that, that notifies your doctor, can notify the hospital. We don't need 5G for that, but everyone's hyping it up. And I think the key is, where do you need low latency? 
If you have wired connection, you already have low latency. It's in the microseconds. So it's only wireless and we don't need 5G for 90% of the applications. In fact, I can't even think of one where we do need it other than autonomous cars and that scares the hell out of me with the way they're designing them that they're gonna require the internet of things and 5G to work seamlessly together. Uh, we, we, can you imagine you had a problem with the, uh, the internet uh, here on a, in a relatively stable environment? Can you imagine that on a highway in the middle of uh, uh, Iowa that suddenly the sensors go out, but the car doesn't really know what to do and keeps on driving into a wall or into a truck or into a, an emergency vehicle? I don't think that's the right solution for that today. Maybe in 50 years, but not today. You know, one of the things that I wanted to mention that goes with that question uh, that you asked there, Michael, was that uh, when I worked at IBM, one of the things that we had done there was uh, they would have a usually annually would have a, a competition of sorts uh, trying to find people that could apply uh, some of the offerings that they had at IBM and could they use it for some common good, you know. And uh, one of the teams that had done this, I think this is maybe going back about four or five years ago now, was they came up with a project, they call it Project OWL, if I recall. I think we could Google that if we wanted to. But they had these uh, units they called uh, they had ducks and geese or something like this, but uh, uh, the idea was that they were using the um, a really uh, uh, a frequency that we don't use very often for connecting things, but this frequency allowed them to talk to your to your cell phone, uh, and if if um, there was a, an emergency situation like uh, you know floods in one area a regional flood or a typhoon or a hurricane or this type of thing, and all the communications were out in that area or, you know, maybe not, not as accessible as they had been previously, uh, you, might, you might be familiar with when you go to like a hotel or, or something like that, or now sometimes even stores offer this, uh, you can get that Wi-Fi connection, but you have to sign in, you know, you usually have to sign an agreement there that says, you know, that you're going to use it without, you know, some illegal, you know, you're not going to do anything illegal or any of this type of thing. Uh, there's usually a screen that comes up on your browser and you have to, you know, answer that. Or sometimes if you're in a hotel, you have to put in your hotel room number or whatever to get access to the internet through their Wi-Fi. Well, they use this uh, frequency that allows you to send data, but only a very small amount of data. It's not like 5G where you can send a ton of data uh, this is something where you could send just uh, a few, a little bit of data, you know, a few bytes of data over this uh, long range, and it allows you then to use that that data with your cell phone to uh, communicate with what they had was they had some central units, and they would launch these. Originally, I think the idea was to launch them with weather balloons in this area wherever there would be a disaster, and and then have some smaller ones, and they had this whole network that they would put together. Uh, some of them, they would airdrop them into like a pond or into a place, and they would receive this data from your cell phone, and then they would use this low frequency to communicate with one another. And with that, they were able to send just small pieces of data and get information from people from their cell phones of whether they needed help or not. You know, do they need to be airlifted, or is there somebody that has a medical emergency during that disaster? And this was a really big idea, and they've, they've gone to like FEMA and other organizations, and they've worked with them on it. So um, this is a, that's an application where they don't need 5G. We just need to send a little bit of data, but that, that little bit of data is very important data, you know, if somebody has an emergency or whatever during a uh, disaster. So there's an application where 5G isn't really needed, but and this is a case where, you know, the Internet of Things can be really used to help someone. Yeah, I think I remember example. reading great something example. about that, Henry, and I think that they actually they were using it because it's a very long distance, so you don't need yes. cell towers every two, three miles. I think they're using it even for backups on uh, on pipelines to send something oh, really? out 30, 40 miles, but at very, uh, very low data rates. Right. A lot, of, a lot of great ideas out there, and a lot of it is that we interconnect, start interconnecting anything. I think, Michael, just on the other side, the future is very bright here. I don't think we know what those future looks like, like we don't know what the first uh, Lotus 1 to 3 or Excel application is. 
But being able to, to connect things, we're going to have a lot of brilliant people come up with things that we have never even dreamed of. Well, that's uh, thank you for putting a positive spin on this, because um, you know there is a lot of hype, and we and it sounds like there's a, a lot of that has been debunked in the course of um, of today's panel discussion. So I appreciate the positive spin. Um, is there before we wrap up? Is there any last um, any last words that any of you want to want to want to have on the subject? Uh, otherwise, we will uh, we will call it a day, and um, and we'll and we'll move on. Uh, anybody have any last last words? Michael, I'd like to say just one last thing about uh, about security and the Internet of Things. There's there's an entire <clears throat> browser and browser ecosystem out there be called Shodan, S H O D A N, and S H O D A N is kind of the Google of the Internet of Things. And it's it's free to sign up for and start looking at it. Um, I was just running it in the background right now and looking for um, all of the open uh, video cameras that I could get to. And and those are all on the Internet of Things. And I can get to 132 from my iPad that I'm running this on. And, you know, there's several in Italy, uh, Russia. In fact, the one in Russia is already marked as a honeypot. Which is the place where you try and and scam the scammers, the, the hackers. So that's available to you today. You can look in your city. You can look in your organization. When I walk before I walk into a uh, meeting with clients in say an Exxon facility or British Petroleum or something like that, I always run Shodan and I put that and I show that on the screen and show them what vulnerabilities they have in their own facility at that point in time. So. I can't emphasize enough that if if you're in the IT world, you don't know what people have hooked up to your system. You don't know how many webcams somebody may have put out there and are, are hooked to their laptop or their desktop. So these are things that you can be proactive today in your IT organization. Bring up Shodan and take a look and see what you've got. Good tip. Good tip. Um, Henry, Larry, any final words before we wrap up? I'm looking forward to sitting in on Henry's talk on in October on uh, you know do it do it yourself IoT or what I'm going to call the maker movement. There's uh, a big opportunity for people to learn. It's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, you said your uh, father gave you your soldering iron. It's uh, seven. Don, uh, my uh, my son gave his uh, his daughter and his son uh, uh, soldering irons when they were uh, ten. So. Uh, that's part of it. I think the future we're going to have a whole different level of technology expertise that I'm sure will come up with uh, ideas for uh, Internet of Things, smart cities, smart homes, et cetera, that again, we haven't even dreamed of that'll make it as uh, hopefully a bright future if we can get past this uh, COVID situation that we're in and some of the politics around it. Well, thank you. At this point, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today, and you can always capture the recording uh, at your convenience on our website at any time. Uh, but at this point, we'd like to thank you all for joining us. Thank, thank you, my esteemed panel. I got professionals on the stage that can keep this conversation going without the moderator. That's why they're. That's why they do this. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.